kingdom. That we get to rest in your grace and love. We, pre- we ask you one thing today that you might teach us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Uh, so one of my favorite movies, um, and I'm curious who's seen it, is The Italian Job. Anybody seen it? You can be proud. You're not volunteering for anything, I promise. You're just saying that you've seen the movie. Um, so, so I love the movie The Italian Job, and there's r- this really cool scene that's a part of the movie that's really important to it as well. Um, and it's at the, kind of the beginning that this group of thieves are kind of starting to get together. By the way, it's kind of bad that one of my favorite movies is about thieves. Um, We won't go into that, though. There's probably some conscious thing that's there that we don't want to mess with. But anyway, these thieves are getting ready. They're starting to um, plan the big heist that they're going to have. And and so uh, two of the characters are there, and the other characters start showing up on motorcycles or cars or whatever. And the character that knows the other characters, he starts introducing them. But he doesn't just say their name and what their skill is. He kind of explains a little bit about their past criminal history. So he talks about the one guy that blew up a toilet in sixth grade. He talks about the other guy who who has a Guinness Book of World Records for the longest police chase ever. And so he talks about all these guys that are going to be a part of the team. Now, now it's a cool part of the movie because you get to hear kind of these little short mini stories. But it's also very important to the story. Because in that, like, it's only like a few minutes of the movie, but in that few minutes of the movie, we get introduced to these characters that are going to be important. And here's the thing. When we're watching a movie, when we're listening to a book, if we don't understand characters and can't relate to them, we don't get drawn into the story in the same way. And so because of that, today, we're going to be spending most of our time not talking about the book of Philippians, but in the book of Acts. And why are we going to do that? Well, the reason we're going to do that is that we get to meet three characters. Three characters that I believe are really important to the Philippian church. They're, never, they're hardly mentioned by name again in the book of Philippians, but we know that they were part of the early Christians in Philippi. Now, the other thing I want you to note about the church of the Philippians is they are a little bit different church. If you've ever read any of Paul's books, Apostle Paul wrote more books of the Bible than anyone else. If you've ever read any of his books, um, what you know is this. He can be pretty harsh, pretty mean. He can kind of go after people. That's what he does. But when we read the book of the Philippians, we see, hear some different things. We hear him say, I thank God for all my remembrance of you. Or there's this. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. Or there's this. How I yearn for you with all the affections of Jesus Christ. How I yearn for you with all the affections of Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't talk that way about other Christians in his books, but he does about the Philippians. And I believe that Paul, he loved this Philippians church. But what I want you to show you today is these aren't just random people. These are people he knows his story, their story, and these are people who the gospel has worked in their broken life to bring them restoration. So good? So we good to dive in? Um, so the, the words are going to be up on the screen. Um, you can grab your bulletin. You can grab your Bible. You can grab your device and, and follow along with us. We are going to be in Acts chapter 16. And we're going to start with verse 11. And we're going to just kind of walk through this. So hopefully God will make it interesting. Because it probably won't be very interesting if it's just me. So hopefully he does that hard task. Um, and I do the easy one. Uh, so setting sail from Troas... We made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and following day to Neapolis, and there from Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia in a Roman Roman colony, we remained in the city some day. So uh, for those of you who love geography, uh, Philippi is a city that would be in present day Greece, and it's kind of on the, if we think about Greece as a pot, it's kind of on the handle of the pot. So it's kind of right down on the handle of the pot that is Greece. Um, If you like geography, that's for you. If not, just disregard. Um, And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. So so an important note here, um, these are not Jewish people in the sense that people who have adopted all of the Jewish customs. But this prayer meeting is God followers. 
So they're probably Greek and Roman, maybe mostly women, but people that, that like the idea of there being one God, and something has drawn them to the Jewish faith, but they haven't dived completely into it. So they're kind of having their own like prayer meeting, their own a Bible study down by the river. They're kind of seeking after something that isn't generally known in their culture. So that's where Paul and his companions went. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So, our first character, Lydia. Who is Lydia? Let's start with this. Lydia is a rich fashionista. That's who Lydia is. Now, now let me defend it with scripture. Um, So at that day, there was no Gucci. There was no Prada. Um, I'm not even going to try to name any other fashion companies because I don't know if I even know anymore. But there there was no top-of-the-line fashion companies of the day. Nobody cared what was on your tag. Nobody cared what brand you were wearing. But do you know what people did care about? The color you were wearing. Does anybody have purple on today? In that day, if you had purple on today, in that day, you would be wearing the Gucci and the Prada. That that was purple. Because purple fabric was only for the most wealthy. It was a really expensive dye. And so Lydia, a seller of purple, she is a fashion designer. She is at the top of her game. She's also rich. How do I know that? She has two houses. And one, and one of them is not a vacation home. These are two houses. She's a house in Thyatira, where she's from. She's a house in, in Philippi. Now, I'm just guessing, but they weren't small houses. This is someone who is high achieving, incredibly smart, has accomplished a lot. E- even I'll say this, I believe she has cracked the glass ceiling that most women of her day has. She has achieved more than most of the people around her. Having two houses, having being a fashionista. She is wealthy, she is successful, she is driven, she is type A. If she sets her mind to it, she can accomplish it. That's the type of person Lydia is. But yet, there's a problem. If you pick up the problem with Lydia, although Lydia is successful, rich, independent, strong willed, she's lacking something. Why do you think she's out on, the sun, on a Saturday and she's out by the river with a bunch of women? Why isn't she out earning money? Because she's realized with all of her success, all the things she's accomplished, that she's lacking something. That all the money in her life couldn't give her what she really needed. And she's lacking something. And so Paul comes in And he talks not about achieving, but he talks about a hope that's external to her. For the first time, Lydia hears this. She hears that in an achievement-based world, that it's already been done by Jesus. That he's accomplished everything for her. In an achievement-based world, that Jesus has already done it, and she hears the hope in the gospel. The hope that's greater than the greatest success she could ever have. And she believes, and her whole family believes, and she invites Paul back to her really nice, really big house. And that's where I believe that the first house church in Philippi was. I believe it was at Lydia's house. So there we go. So there's our first character. You want to meet character number two? So continuing on, starting with verse, uh, back up with verse 16. As they were going to the place of prayer, they were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. So the slave girl, she's possessed by a demon, but she can tell the future. And she's valuable because of that. So she followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. And when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. So, Lydia, high-achieving, 
highly intelligent, highly successful, really valuable in human standards. Slave girl, the exact opposite. The exact opposite. Well, let's start with this. Uh, she's a slave. So quite simply, what that means is she's a human being who's owned by another human being. You can't get any worse than that. But we can add to it. So we have to hypothesize. The Bible's over there. I'm over here. Why was she sold into slavery? Knowing what we know about the times, our best guess, the reason she was sold into slavery is because her parents didn't have enough money to take care of her. So they made a valuable, uh, they made a valuable choice and profited themselves by selling their daughter into slavery. You think she felt loved? You think she struggled with her parents and what they did for, to her? Yeah, it gets worse. So owned by other people, sold into slavery by her own parents. But here's the thing, the only thing that was lovable about this little girl was the fact that she had an evil spirit who could tell the future. You know what that evil spirit did to her? It tormented her. It caused her anxiety. It caused her physical, emotional, and spiritual pain. And that, that evil spirit, was the only thing about this little girl that the world saw lovable. The thing that tormented her the most was the thing other people valued about her. You can't get any d more down in the dumps than this little girl. But yet, what does God do? God brings the same, same work of the gospel into this little girl's life. But I love how God does it. God does it by this girl being annoying, right? Paul gets, Paul gets, we'll just say it this way, Paul gets a little pissed off at her. She's following him around, annoying him, right? Do you know any little girls like that, right? Sometimes they're like that. We love them to death, but sometimes they get annoying. That's what's going on here. But what does Paul do? He gets annoyed, and he says, hey, evil spirit, be gone. And God brings restoration into this little slave girl's life. The demon is gone. Her oppression is gone. Even her slavery is gone because her captors have no use for her now anymore. The slave girl was unloved by all. But she was loved by God. She was cared for and valuable to no man, to no human being. But God still loved her and cared for her. God called her more than a commodity, and God loved her abundantly, and restoration came into this little girl's life. So Lydia, top of the top, best of the best, God brings restoration into her. But the same gospel comes to this little girl and tells her a, a little bit different story but tells her she are, is loved despite what's going on. Okay, you ready for one more? One more person, is that okay? So we're going to pick up um, verse 20. Let's keep going. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are unlawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowds joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods, and when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Isn't Paul frustrating as a prison guard? Like you're trying to punish him and he like is rejoicing and singing, right? It reminds me a little bit of about a time when I was young and I got a spanking from my parents. I, I'm pretty sure I deserved it. Um, but they gave me a spanking and then I went in my room and I'm like, I told my brother, I'm like, John, it didn't hurt. I had a diaper on. Like you want to frustrate parents. Tell them that their punishment didn't work. But that's kind of how, how Paul was. Now, now, I personally, I got another spanking, uh, this time without the diaper on. Um, my parents didn't have to think very long about that. But Paul, that's how frustrating he is. You try to punish him. You try to get it to stick. You try to teach him something. He doesn't care. He's in prison, in chains, and shackles. He just, he praises God. He, he worships him. He's kind of just a little bit frustrating, I have to believe, for the prison guards. 
And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everybody's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them at the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to his house and set food before him, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Okay, so we got Lydia, top of the top, highly successful. We got the slave girl down, down in the gutter, as low as she can be. So here we have the jailer. So what do we know about the jailer? So, so in my mind, in my idea, he's kind of, he's one of those blue-collar workers. He works hard during the day, and then he comes home and he drinks a beer. Maybe that's just because Father's Day, and I'm looking forward to my beer later today. Um, but but that's, that's who he is. He's that blue-collar worker. But more truthfully, uh, you know, and honestly, I, I think what we know about him is a jailer is someone of honor and integrity. He's a man of honor and integrity. And, and how do I know that? So, so we see this jailer. After the prisoners escape, what does he do? He pulls his sword, and he's getting ready to take his life. Now, now I want to be clear. This is not the typical despair suicide. It's not. That's not what's going on here. It's not a regular suicide. But he's ready to take his life. Why? Because he is a man of honor and integrity. And he believes in it. He holds to it. It's one of the tenets that he lives his life by. But why is that honor and integrity to take your life? If you know anything about the Roman Empire, you know that um, if you were a prison guard and the prisoner got away, that your life would be forfeited that you would go to trial, you'd be executed. That's what happened. But notice, this man has such high honor and integrity that he's not going to try to weasel his way out. He's not even going to make the executioner do, it him, do the job. He's going to do it himself. He is a man driven by honor and integrity. Now you can probably imagine somebody like that. Maybe some of you have tendencies like that. I would imagine this guy, he knows every fault he's made. He knows his past mistakes. He knows the things that have done, he has done wrong, and those things keep him awake. You see, a person of honor and integrity is also very hard on themselves. They expect perfection out of themselves. They expect not only that other people do it right, but they expect that they do it right too. And so I have to imagine some of this man's honor and integrity is because he's trying to make up for the past mistakes that he's made, the problems and issues that he's done. But notice how the gospel comes into his life. This man of honor and integrity, this man of always doing what it's right, he had his issues because sometimes he had failed to do what he knew he was supposed to do. He probably even had some guilt about worrying about his guilt. That's the type of guy he was. But yet, this prison guard, he learned about God's unmerited favor. He learns that God doesn't weigh our our mistakes and the things we've done wrong, the things we've done right. He doesn't weigh our good things and our bad things. That God loves us with grace, unmerited favor. God loves us not because of us, but because of who he is for us. And the prison guard learned about grace. So I want to ask you this question, because I think probably all of us have tendencies of some of these people. So I want to ask you this question, who are you in this story? What type of grace do you need today? What what type of restoration do you need from God today? Are you Lydia, high achieving, driven, you've accomplished a lot, but yet, even all those accomplishments don't give you value that you need. Only God can give that. Are you today, in your past, in your present, are you utterly broken? Do you feel unloved? 
unwanted, undesirable? Have things happened in your life that have caused you grief beyond compare? Is that where you are today? Know that even because of those things, you are still loved abundantly by God, and God cares deeply for you. Are you the jailer? Are you honor and integrity? Do you live your life by a code? Do you feel the weight of that? You know what God wants to give to you? He wants to give you that reminder that your worth and your value aren't following the rules and doing all the right things. God wants to restore you by letting you know that he has grace for you and forgiveness for you. Where are you today? Where do you find yourself today? Because here's the thing. The gospel of Jesus, I promise you, it speaks into that situation. It speaks into that situation with the hope that the world is greater than what we see greater than what we can conceive, but we have a God who cares deeply about you. God speaks restoration into all of our lives. And then we get to have the great joy that God unites us in community. Isn't that neat? That God invite, unites all different people in community. The, the reality is that these three people that we've talked about Lydia, the high-achieving CEO, type-driven, A, type A personality. The jailer, blue-collar, hard-working, honor and integrity. The slave girl, bottom of the social class if we were to categorize it. Those three people should have never associated together. Let's be honest. They should have never been friends. But yet I believe that the church in Philippi that Paul's talking to, these people are important parts of it. And God unites us as a church in the same way. I think it's a great gift that we aren't all the same. We don't need to be all the same. In fact, it's a blessing that we're not. It's a blessing that we come from different pasts, that we're in different presence, that we have different realities. It's a blessing. Uh, so the church that I served at prior to this one, um, there was two people that I really admired, and they were both very different. Um, William was a chef at a small restaurant, and he was a prep chef. He wasn't a head chef. So he would probably, what we would call as Americans, we'd call him lower class. Now, now again, I, I loved this guy so much. He was very involved in our church. He did a lot for us. He cooked. I loved whenever he cooked because he was a great cook, and we had great fellowship events when he cooked. That was wonderful. And I watched him become friends with, with the CEO. His name was Larry. And the CEO was driven, highly intelligent, intellectual, very well educated. He was at the top of his game. And it was so cool. I watched these two people become friends. Isn't that neat? That what we get in our church body, because I believe that all church bodies are like this, what we get in this church body is a people of great diversity, but yet... We get a people that are united by one thing. The fact that Jesus has restored our lives. And we get to center around the gospel. And so my encouragement for you, my challenge for you maybe today, is to get to know somebody different here at church. Because by getting to know each other, we get to celebrate what God has done for us. That unitedness in the gospel that we all have. Would you take some time to pray with me? Uh, dear Jesus, we thank you for being our God and our King. We thank you that the gospel unites all of us, that it brings us together, that it gives us our worth and our value. We pray that you'd continue to work in us, that we might believe that. Dear Heavenly Father, be with all people who are hurting today. Uh, be with those who are recovering and healing after surgery, especially Marjorie Richter and Sandy Peterson. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for peace and comfort for the family and fellow officers of William Moden, Colorado State Patrol officer that was killed on Friday. We pray that you'd be with his family, especially his wife, especially his close friends and fellow officers. Just give them your peace. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for God that he would provide can a candidate for our fourth grade teaching position. And we thank you for Madison that she's willing to take on and, and come on into our family as our fifth grade teacher. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for our family night event on June 18th and that the Lord would show us and lead us to who to, we should invite. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for all of those here today that are, that are struggling with you in various ways. 
that they are unsure of, of your love because of circumstances in their life. Dear Heavenly Father, would you just give them peace and hope in you? Would you remind them in faith that you do love and care about them, that you care about all your children here on this world? We pray that you would work through them and in them so they might know that you are a God of love. To Heavenly Father, we pray all this in your name. Amen. And we pray together the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.